to one. OK, welcome everyone to the Greater Manchester Transport Committee Bus Services Subcommittee. Um, we'll go through the agenda as set out. Item one is apologies for absence. Uh, I've received an apology from Barry Warner, whose family are having real problems with COVID at the moment. Any other apologies for absence? None that I'm aware of, Chair. OK, Chair's announcements and urgent business. I don't think I've got any. Moving on declarations of interest, we ask all members to uh, to make sure that they declare if they've got any interest in the agenda. Item four is minutes of the meeting held on the 13th of November. First of all, are members happy to approve those as a correct record? Aye. Everybody, everybody happy with that? OK. Um, Item five is the Greater Manchester Transport Committee work programme. Uh, are there any comments on questions on that? And does an officer wish to speak on this item, please? Thanks, Chair. I'm, I'll, I'll take this item. Um, just to say to members, this is uh, the updated work programme for both the main committee and the subcommittees um, from January through to the end of March. Members have any questions or comments on it? I'm happy to try and respond. Okay, thanks. Um, I think much of this we've already seen before, but does anybody want to make any comments or ask any questions? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Who said that? Nathan. Oh yes, carry on. Yeah, sorry, I've got you. Thanks. So, so that we've got the agenda for the next three months, and it seems to be ignoring uh, the elephant in the room. We're doing buses differently. We've got a consultation closing in two weeks, 29th of Jan. Um, many of us will have received a letter uh, basically querying uh, the legality at this point, asking for an extension and greater transparency. And it'd be wrong for me not to bring it up here. We're trying to hold a consultation while we are trying to vaccinate the whole of the population of the UK. We had a presentation in Trafford before Christmas, I think it was about November, about the last consultation that went on between October and January, which cost £650,000. It got 8,500 responses, £76 per response. In June, GMCA and TFDM decided that because of the ongoing impact of COVID, that £650,000, uh, we had no idea whether it was wasted or not. So why are we going back to a consultation at this moment in time? Nathan, what what are you actually asking? Well, I'm asking why, given the consideration wow. of spending between zero and three hundred million pounds, it's not at the top of our agenda every single time. Nathan, Nathan, can I just explain? I think this is simple to understand. This committee is not dealing with bus franchising, nor is it dealing with the consultation, because it's been dealt with directly by the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the 10 leaders. They're in charge of it. They've been in charge of it from day one. So although we've got a huge interest and we want to know what's going on and we get regular reports back, we are not dealing with it. Therefore, if you said, I wish to raise an issue on this, you're in the wrong place. It's up to you and the leaders of your authority to discuss the issues. And this transport committee really is just a watching brief because it, we're not handling the issue. Is that yeah. clear? But yeah, that's fair, but I still... I'm no, is it clear? It's clear, that. but I'm still... It's clear. Well, then, well then, there, there isn't much we're, we're, Because, as you've just said, we, we've got a watching brief on buses. Why is it not there in the next three months? Anything, you know, to say, you know what, we've had 50,000 responses and the response has been great. We're, with nothing, not a peep, and we're the watching brief on buses. I just... Well, well, I can assure you that when the combined authority gets a report back and the, the Greater Manchester Mayor gets a report back, we'll get a copy of that report and we'll make sure it's on the, the main committee agenda. It won't be on this agenda, but, but but we'll put it on the main committee agenda. But but I'm not avoiding any of the issues you want to raise, but this is just the wrong forum to raise them because we're not so, dealing with the issue. OK, so to close up, could you ask the officers to tell me where that forum is? That's it. Because if it's GMCA main it's, meeting, that isn't a forum to scrutinise anything. It's a closed meeting and no one can scrutinise it. Well, uh, it, it. Ask a question. 
Yeah, it's the Greater Manchester. I don't want to put the officers on the spot because this is a, you know, yeah, a no, political. Right. No, no. Well, you've asked the question and I'm telling you, it's the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the 10 leaders. And I would be saying to you, if you or any members have got any issues on this, you should be writing or going to see your leader of your authority to talk through the issues. That's that's what you need to do. That's what I do in Salford and that's what you've got to do in Trafford. OK, thank you. Any other questions on item five? Everybody? Yeah, there's an indication in the uh, chat if you would just. Oh, I missed that. Sorry. Uh, you've got Councillor Leach next. Oh, John. I've lost John. Where's John? John Leach. Um, it, I wasn't asking to speak on this item. I'd actually put a note to say that I wanted to speak on the first annex. That was all. I was just all right. doing a, oh, sorry. a, a oh. note in advance. Councillor Stoyer, Councillor Stoyer, then next chair. Right. Hi, I'm Thank you, Chair. Um, on uh, page 15, it says to be scheduled the decarbonisation of transport report. I'd just like some reassurance um, that this will be um, brought to the committee before the end of the municipal, municipal year. Thank you. Yeah, we, we definitely said we'd do that. Can I ask an officer to comment on that, please? Chair, I do, I do, it's Gwyn Williams. Um, I just don't think that officers have had an opportunity to meet to to, to put it in the schedule. Um, Nicola, the, the governance officer, is, it will be meeting with officers of TFGM and we will ensure that it's in the programme. OK, I think members would like to give uh, uh, Angeliki that, that confirmation that we'll definitely be discussing that issue in the next month or two. OK, anything else on item five? Chair, you've got oh. Councillor Mella. Oh, Councillor Mella, I can see you. Sorry, I'm I'm not I'm not up to the chat. I think it's me rather than you. Sorry, David. Sorry, right. thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I just wanted to to raise in relation to the work programme. I suggested some time ago, and I know we're in the midst of another lockdown now. Um, but I, I'm very keen that, that as a committee, um, not just as a subcommittee, but I guess really as as an overall transport committee. Um, we need to consider how to get patronage back onto the network what, once all this is over or, or at least more manageable. It did seem to be an, an agenda item in the past, but it, it looks to have fallen off. Um, I just I, I want to ensure that we, we, we keep that on there because obviously, you know, I don't want to get into the minutiae of, of, of bus reform right now, but, but regardless of whichever route we go down, we need to ensure we get the patronage on the network or we need to look at ways to get patronage back onto the network. <laughs> Um, and it was on the um, it was on the work programme, but, but as I've said, it, it looks to have fallen off. Can, can I just get assurances it will appear or it will, David, it will we're, return? We're going to have to address that at the main committee. And, uh, yeah. and the reason I say that is that if you look at the current transport that's available, both the tram, the rail uh, and the bus, they are heavily um, obviously subsidised by the government at the moment due to lockdown and various other things. And the worrying thing for me isn't that. What the worrying thing is, is if the government starts to change and reduce the amount of money they give to the various operators, then we've got a substantial problem on our hands. And I agree, patronage is very important. But uh, So I, I can give you that assurance. We, at the main committee, we are going to have to address this issue, uh, you know, because it's important. OK. Oh, well, that's great. Thank you, Chair. Any other comments or questions? OK, uh, the next item is an update from the bus operators. Now, I'm not exactly sure how many bus operators are with us, but I'm hoping that at least one of them want to speak on this item. Morning, Chair. It's Adam at Stagecoach. I'm happy to uh, pick this up from our point of view. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, following the reintroduction of lockdown, our passenger levels are currently around 30%. Uh, we're not experiencing any staffing issues at present, uh, but following guidance from the Department of Transport and in consultation with TFGM, uh, we are reducing our higher frequency services on a Monday to Friday, uh, and that change will come in at the end of this month. Thank you. Can I? It's Adam, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, Adam, let, let me just ask you when it comes to stagecoach, particularly, I, have you any issues with government about funding at the moment or, or have you not got issues with them? Uh, you're asking the wrong person, I'm afraid. 
I'm not aware of any issues. That doesn't mean there aren't any issues. I don't, right. you know, I probably wouldn't be made aware if there were issues. But right. as far as I am aware, there are no issues at present. All right. Where's, who is the right person? Just it's, out of it. it's Ben Jarvis, who's our commercial right. director. Unfortunately, he's not able to make the call this morning. No, that's OK. I understand what you're saying. Any other bus operators who'd like to comment? Ian. Thank you, Chair. Um, our position is, is, is similar to Stagecoach. Uh, patronage is about 30%. Um, it, did, it did recover considerably in the autumn, uh, but has now gone back down again. Quite localised, the variations in patronage, but certainly not gone back down to the levels it was in the first lockdown at the beginning of uh, 2020. Uh, once again, a quick um, tribute to the staff who have continued to work throughout this difficult period very, very well with constantly updating requirements and safety requirements and changes to to to, re to their schedules and their working patterns. It's been a, a very difficult year for them as well. Um, I think just on the, the, the funding question there, Chair, um, at the moment um, the DFT is encouraging operators to be efficient in terms of their resources and they've placed um, a much stronger emphasis on local consultation this time round rather than applying arbitrary limits from the centre. So everything is to be done by discussion and agreement with local authorities, obviously in our case TFGM. That's been a, a very strong message, but there hasn't been an arbitrary requirement or indeed, as I understand it, a threat as yet to significantly change the funding mechanism. Right, OK, thanks, Ian. Any other bus operators who would like to comment, please? Hi, good morning, everybody. It's Alistair from Areva. Um, Hi, Alistair. Uh, uh, same for us, to be quite honest. Um, you know, there's been no indication yet from DFT that they are going to change the funding structure, as far as I'm aware. Um, there is apparently, they have said that they expect operators, I think uh, Ian's just touched on this, to make, to make efficient use of the resources. Um, so, you know, that that's maybe something we, we will need to look at and of course they think the other thing is is we no, none of us know at the minute how long this lockdown is going to last you know the, obviously there was talk initially of well the schools will go back after half term and that's actually only four weeks away now you know so by the time you know if we do do you, you, we could end up as operators doing some sort of something fairly significant at the end of january and they have to put it put everything back together again in the middle of february yeah and um, so it's a bit of um it's a bit of an unknown quantity at the minute um, for us, in terms of staff, we, we're OK. We've got virtually no uh, no uh, positive cases now. Very few people isolating due to contact. We have a number of staff off sick or who are furloughed because they're, cl they're classified as clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, and obviously there's no there's no likelihood that we were asking those to come back to the workplace anytime soon. Um, so in terms of where we are at the minute, we're not saying we won't reduce timetables over the next week or two, um, but at this minute we've not made it. We haven't made a, a firm decision to whether to or whether not to. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Alistair. Any other bus operators who would like to comment? I'll bring in Roy in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's Paul Taylor here from uh, Transdev. Um, without repeating everything everybody else has said. Uh, the I suppose the, the other issue just to, to throw in um, and as Isa says we've got drivers off who are uh, in the, the CEV category uh, understandably uh, one of the challenges at the moment um, for recovery is being able to uh, train new drivers um, which is is not possible um, unless you have your own examiner um, so the I think the, the logic of the change has been made in January is to try and keep things stable, uh, but we'll need to have a mind um, in that we, we, we expect some people who are um, in the CEV category may actually choose to retire. Um, as we, we have seen, some people have left uh, that we weren't expecting to during the uh, during the pandemic. And it's a bit of a challenge to replace them with new, with new starters at the moment because of the, the ability to train. Uh, so that's something we'll be trying to manage as best we can. Obviously, we'll try and recruit people who already have licenses and such like, um, but just another, another complexity to add in there. OK, cheers. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, good morning, Chair. Uh, Matt Rollins from Dime Bus Northwest. Um, very, very similar story to, to what other operators have said. We, we've gone from 
60% um, pattern is down to low 30s again. Um, no current plan to, to change anything um, with our services at present. Again, I think one of the uncertainties is, uh, is the social distance and if that moves to two, two metres then uh, that'll certainly put some pressure on the, the vehicles that are already out there. So at this moment in time, no plan changes um, other than to hold off what we were planning on increasing on the 31st of January, but we'll obviously watch that closely and change it, make changes where required. OK, thanks, Matt. Any any other bus operators? I've got a number of members who want to come in, but I thought we'll do the bus operators first, then we'll we'll come back to members. Hi, Roger, I'm, I'm here. I managed to get in the meeting, but I've nothing further to add. The, the colleagues have put it really well. OK, OK, thank you. Anyone else? OK, Roy, I've got you for down. Yes, I just like it's not a criticism or a question for a change, like, but as a councillor, usually speak when there are criticisms. But and it's not just because I got a Christmas card from Diamond, but I would like to express <laughs> you, on behalf you got a of Christmas Christmas card. Have you declared that? <laughs> no, uh, I'd just like to um, express the appreciation of residents in the Berry area for the staff in Diamond, uh, particularly who we'll cover a lot of the routes now for trying to keep to time and stopping for people when they're slipping down or whatever and keeping the service going very well. Uh, and little things like because there are not many on sometimes, they stop to catch up with time. They don't race ahead usually. I know every member of staff isn't perfect, but most of them are very good. And I'd, like, I'd include Go Northwest who run the 98 which uh, used to be the worst bus service, I was told by a Polish lady in the Europe, uh, is a lot better than it was. So generally the bus drivers, the staff, I think are doing the best in very difficult circumstances. And I'd like to express my appreciation as a bus user. Thank you. OK, thanks, Roy. Warren? I think that should be minuted. Whatever our problems and questions, they are so far for months now doing a very good job. OK, thanks. Warren? Right, I'm unmuted. Right, no, I, I, it's just a question uh, really from about uh, what the gentleman from TransDev said about uh, when the, when it's over and there's going to be a lot of drivers who've left either taking early retirement or health retirement and it's going to affect all the operators. I just wondered, is there any way they could get together in cooperation to set up a training program so that each company could say we've got three people here that want training and uh, send them to the appropriate place. I just wondered whether we could, TFGM or Transport for Greater Manchester, it's uh, Greater Manchester Transport Committee could help in any way in setting up a training program because it, it is a it is going to be a problem post pandemic. Paul, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, certainly, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the, the issue isn't the need for or the ability to set up a program at the moment. The the ability is to um, is to have is the availability of examiners or basically testers. So we do uh, we do our training in house um, and it is. For, for, for some of us, we have external DVSA um, uh, examiners who will do the test. Uh, some operators have their own delegated ones in house, um, and it's only those who currently can work. So uh, even if we all got together and came up with a joint plan, we couldn't use each other's um, delegated examiner. So it's it's a question of, of, of basically, and we are actively doing this, is just lobbying DFT and um, DVSA to make sure as soon as soon as possible that that capacity is brought back in, uh, obviously in a safe uh, and respectful manner to the individuals involved. Uh, I just intended to flag it up that it it is one of the challenges we are, we will have to overcome at some stage, uh, and it may be that as a result of that some of the reduced service levels may have to last a little bit longer um, than we may think. Uh, while we get our staff numbers back to the back to the level that we normally would. Okay. OK, thanks. I've got Sean and then Phil Burke and then Mark Aldred. Sean. 
Yep, yeah, uh, thanks, Roger. And um, I suppose just to echo what Councillor Walker said around uh, thanks to the bus operators and their staff for, for keeping services running to the extent that they have. There's still a lot of people out there that rely upon uh, bus services because they have to get to and from work or get the kids to and from school and they don't have private transport. So uh, we know that it is a, a, a risky job under the current circumstances and, and people are doing it very well. Uh, my question is uh, in relation and is in relation to contactless payments. And I know that um, the operators that are represented on the meeting today are perhaps the wrong people to direct this to, because as far as I'm aware, all of those present are uh, companies which offer contactless payments for people paying with debit cards or credit cards or, or, or whatever means they may use. But when we're using um, smaller bus firms, particularly for tendered services, which arguably carry passengers that do uh, make essential journeys, that's why we have to provide a subsidy because they are socially necessary bus services that people use to make essential, uh, essential journeys. Uh, the ability doesn't always exist on some of the operators that we contract those to for people to pay contactless. Um, and I know there are examples within my neighbourhood and the area that I represent where there are services that operate where while you can use your con concessionary pass or your hour pass or whatever it might be, if you want, if you were a fare paying passenger and you wanted to be able to buy a fare and, and buy a ticket on the bus, you would have to pay cash. And that is being discouraged, uh, understandably and rightly so, by the bigger operators that have the facility to pay with a debit card. But I just think in the interest of public safety and also in the interest of future proofing the network, we should be taking the opportunity now to roll out contactless payment or support smaller operators that don't currently have it to roll it out so that when we come out of this, it is more attractive and easier for fair paying passengers, which is a, a sector that clearly we want to grow, uh, to use the bus. Uh, and so it might be an officer response that has to come for this. But do we have anything that we can do as TFGM to support the smaller companies to uh, upgrade their machines so that they can take debit and credit card payments? OK, thanks, Sean. Uh, can I ask if there's any TFGM officer who'd like to pick that one up? Thanks, uh, thanks, Roger. Thanks, uh, Councillor Fielding. I think that is something that we're acutely aware of in terms of the ability for, for all operators to be able to pay contactless, um, our customers to be able to pay with contactless on their um, on on all buses. It's something we have looked into, and it's something we're, we're also um, very much engaged with the likes of national government um, uh, in terms of any any sort of strategies and plans that they do do put out. But we will certainly continue to look at it to see if there's things we can do to certainly support that smaller operator cohort. OK, thanks, Alison. Uh, are, do any other bus operators wish to comment on this? You... Silence, right, OK. Uh, Anyway, Sean, we'll, we'll we'll definitely pick that point up because it's a good point. And I know you, I noticed you said small operators, so I think you must be right. That's where the probably the issues are. But uh, I think we, we'll ask TFGM just to perhaps give us a brief report on contactless pay. I think that would be quite helpful. Right, Phil Burke. Phil. Cheers, thanks, Chair. Please could I ask the operators, while I fully understand that services have been reduced and cut in some circumstances, please could they review these routes once things start picking up? Otherwise, we are going to isolate different communities from being able to get out and about. OK, Ian, do you want to comment? Ah. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, it's a good point Councillor Burke makes and the just to make it quite clear the current registrations that we operate to collectively um, the traffic commissioner's view is everything that's changed since last February is technically temporary so we would have to re-register or substantially change everything that we want to do when we, we emerge from this and when uh, CBSSG funding from the DFT comes to an end um, and I'm sure as part of that process just as we've got now with the current service changes there will be an insistence upon local authority consultation before anything is signed off and we we still hope and think that it will not be um, a cliff edge there will be some kind of phased removal from the, the funding period and that will be in, in consultation. There's various models being discussed by the DFT. 
local partnerships of different descriptions. Um, so I don't think it'll be a, a, a sort of a stop start type arrangement. OK, thanks, Ian. Mark. Thanks, Joe. Um, just a couple of things, really. First of all, at the MERS Transport Board last week, the government official though, did say that the funding for bus uh, for the bus, bus operators was being next discussed mid February. So that's probably uh, worth putting the diary. The other thing, on the back of what Sean said about contactless, I've been hearing a number of cases regarding stolen credit cards or debit cards being used on buses as contactless payments. Now, I know the operators will suffer dramatically by that, but also for the people who've had the cars stolen, they're having money took out of their accounts. So I just wondered what operators were doing out there to try and combat that. Were they asking for ID when they're using the contactless payments, etc.? cetera? Um, so just interesting to know each one of the operators, see what they're doing about it. Thank you. OK, thanks, Matt. So mid-February, you're saying? Yes. OK, any bus operator like to comment? Uh, uh, it's Alistair at Arriva again. In terms of the contactless issue, um, the, the there is, uh, it's quite, it's fairly well known now, there, there is some significant criminal activity going on, as, as Councillor Alder has said, with stolen and clone cards. Um, all the operators have been targeted, particularly on the on high value products that are available on bus. And as far as I'm aware, we at Arriva are now the last of the operators to, we will not be selling one particular ticket, which is the, the system one weekly ticket that will not be available by contactless payment on bus as of this weekend. Um, basically because that that is where the fraud's being targeted because it's a, the highest value ticket. In terms of the technology that, that's, that's sort of behind all of it, um, basically what happens is that if it's a stolen card, the the sort of the back office system that that, that we run with, uh, that card isn't actually hot listed until the end of the end of the day. So potentially, even though it's stolen, it can be being used multiple times in the day before it actually gets blocked. And that is, you know, that's something at the minute that is out of out of our our control as an operator. It's it's basically within the, I suppose, the bank, the bank's clearing systems, if you like. Um, so you know, we we see whether with tick, we we use ticket to ticket machines, as do quite a number of the other operators in Greater Manchester. And it's it's something that we've you know we, we've taken up with ticket to, to see whether this, they can do anything. With the sort of the, the technology behind the ticket machines that 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 can you know that can help us to prevent it, but unfortunately at the minute the only way we can we can prevent it is by stopping stopping the sale of that particular product. Okay, thanks, Alistair. Paul, did you want to comment? I, I hadn't planned to add anything to that. No, Chair, yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, okay, thanks for that. Um, right, I think I've covered all the questions. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question who hasn't indicated? OK, thanks to all the bus operators for their for their comments today and we'll uh, we'll move on. Um, item seven is changes to the bus network and Alison is going to take us through the report. However, as a special treat for members of the committee, uh, Nick Roberts did make comments in the briefing, the chair's briefing, about the work that they've been doing behind the scenes. And I thought he should be given the opportunity for the next couple of hours just to tell us exactly what work uh, his team are doing uh, on the subsidised bus network as well as elsewhere. So the floor is yours, Nick. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you for the, the, the big build up. Very unfair, I think. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, with you, or we'll, we'll we'll test the technology. Oh dear. That's not a very good start, Nick. No. That build up. I think it's I a cop out. You just can't get the officers, can you? You just can't. 
What can you do? Anyway, Nick's disappeared now. Just bear right. me a second, Chair. I'll just try and bring him back in the meeting. All right. Right, well, there's a breakdown in communication. We'll just have a, a rest for a minute. I don't know what happened there. Let's try again. Well, we can see you and hear you now. OK, let's try again. That got everyone we, worried. We, let's try we again. think you're trying to avoid doing the presentation, Nick. That's what we think. Oh, right. Uh -huh. Can you see the presentation there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's try again. That got everyone worried. Yes. OK, so. Can you see that? Yeah, Monday to Friday. OK, so that should be at a bus at the top there should say bus service changes in GM. Is that the first slide that you can see? No, no you're on slide seven. seven. OK, let's go <laughs> back. Is that moving at all? No, no, not no. for me. Summary of changes example. Nick, no, you that... just shut it down, reopen it, have the PowerPoint ready and then share your screen. It can be a bit funny on Teams. OK, so I'm going to shut it down again. Let's try again. Reopen. Right, we're on slide one. Yep. Yeah. 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 yeah, you cracked it. <laughs> and is that from the beginning? We don't know what the beginning is. Yeah, yeah playing, playing in PowerPoint now. That's right, it. brilliant. Sorry about that, everyone. Right, mm -hmm. right. From the big build up, I will put this into some context for us all. So, as Councillor Jones said, um, we have a familiar report um, which we bring to the, the committee every every session, which is does what it says on the tin, forthcoming changes to services. But when we met at the agenda setting, um, I did feel that it didn't really represent what had been a particularly busy period for both ourselves and the operators. So when we discussed this, um, Councillor Jones and Councillor Bray said, well, why don't you come along and just share a few slides that kind of outlines the process that we have gone through the last few months and put a bit more context because we do only report the significant changes, which is important because I think as members, you want to know what are the controversial changes, what are the things that, that might cause you a bit of angst, uh, what are positive changes as well. Uh, and that's what we do. That's what we generally do th through this report, which is important. And so just to set it out, just to remind us what it's all about, Annex A is the commercial changes what are led by our operators, which of course important. Uh, and just for the record, Chair, um, in this month's report, there is a slight amendment to that, the 36 and the 37, uh, that Diamond were going to change, and Matt will just confirm this. Uh, we're not going to go ahead with that particular change this month. Diamond are, are pulling back on that. So if we could just make a note of that for the records. And again, we'll, we'll kind of expand that we are in a difficult period at the moment. With, with lockdown, so they've pulled back on that for the for the particular changes. Um, but Annex A is for the commercial changes. Can, Annex B is where TFGM responds to the commercial changes. And Annex C really is where uh, the, the big changes happen in terms of what we control in terms of our network. And that's one I really want to explore in a bit more detail. Because if you look at Annex C for this month, you'd probably look, well, there's, there's not that much there. There's a few changes we've done, but it doesn't really capture the significant work, work that we've done as a team uh, in the last few months. And that's what I really want to expand a little bit um, in these slides. It also gives us um, it gives us time as well to talk in a little bit more detail the work we've done in the last few weeks on schools. And I'll also expand as well uh, a little bit more that the operators talked a little bit around about the mileage changes that we're introducing at the end of the month on the on the the, the wider general network. So I'll just go talk through these slides. It will not be two hours. Don't worry about that. It will be about 10 minutes. And then if I can go through the slides, we'll give plenty of time for, for questions and comments at the end, if I may. 
So in addition to those three annexes that I think we're familiar with, we do have our coordinated fixed change dates that I think uh, people are familiar with, gives it a little bit of control. We of course have to meet with those uh, set timelines that the tra traffic commission have, those 70 days that, that are in place at the moment. But I think as we're all familiar with at the moment, and we'll touch on this as we go through the slides at the moment, um, we've had a bit more flexibility, a little bit more relaxation because of that, that period we're in at the moment because of COVID. And we're all familiar with that. And I think we respect that at the moment. Um, it is a difficult position and therefore we have to appreciate that we've got to be a bit more flexible at the moment with the changes that we do do face. But that's a premise that we work with with the report that we share with you on that regular basis. But when we look at Annex C, and hopefully that slide has changed, um, Annex C is all around the tenders, all around that subsidised budget that we have to, to, to spend and to spend wisely. And back in um, October, because that was the time that we have, have, a, have a look at this, we have to plan in advance. Um, it is a period when, when we have a little bit more control over our time spans. It is a period when we should and we try and work a lot more closely with members in terms of our planning process. Um, we had a, quite an incredible £9.5 million worth of, of local bus contracts to play with. That's no insignificant amount, as you can imagine. Uh, what well, we're looking at probably nearly a third uh, in terms of our overall budget. So at any time uh, uh, of our process, that, that's, that's a big piece of work. Um, throw into the mix that we are in a difficult period of time with COVID, this was a big exercise, not only for us as a team, as a bus service team, but also for the operators. For operators, they're concerned about whether they're going to keep contracts, they're con concerned about how that looks for their business, whether they've got a period of time where they've got to try and bid for contracts. So for the whole of us as a cohort, as a group, it's a busy period. Within that 9.5 million, there were 88 local bus contracts up for grabs uh, across all of GM. And of course, what was made all the more complex is that we were working with that CBSSG, that COVID bus service support grant that I think we're familiar with. Uh, that grant that was given to us when COVID hit to support the industry get through this difficult period with that loss of patronage. And we had to make the assumption, we don't know, has been alluded to already on the call, as, as Councillor Aldred has mentioned, that's up for discussion in February, when that will continue. But we had to make the assumption with these contracts that it wouldn't continue beyond April. So we had to sit in and discuss with operators where the revenue risk would lie. Now, from April, um, we had to assume that revenue risk would drop, there would be low patronage. Now, how can we how can we understand what the market will look in April when we were discussing these back in up in 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 the autumn when really we don't know what's happening with bus services when we come to the end of January. So it was a very difficult thing to discuss and we had to have open discussions, one to one discussions with all our operators around how can you predict a tender market? How can you predict what patronage is going to look like so far in advance? So the options were on the table. As you know, with most of our tendered bus services at the moment, the operators take the revenue risk and they reflect their prices uh, with that at the moment. So we said to the operators, do you want to maintain that revenue risk? Well, if they did, it was quite clear that their prices were going to go up, understandably so. Did they want to pass that revenue risk back to us? Therefore, we would take the revenue risk in terms of TFGM, or maybe it was just too much for them and they didn't want to do any of that and pass the contract back to us for us to, to retender. Whatever the case was, there was a clear situation where there was a lot of engagement going on at that period of time with operators. Uh, and we ended up having a lot of calls, a lot of discussion. And it was clear that whatever was going to happen, the contract commitment that we went into with our operators, we had to be clear, we had to understand uh, where where the liability lie and, and that we were all going on and all, for want of a better phrase, coming from the same sim, uh, hymn seat. So what was the outcome? We decided in the end that we would extend 
36 of the local uh, contracts. We got prices back from the operators. Uh, that's important to a certain extent. Operators obviously want to have certain amount, amount of security. They don't always want us to put stuff out to tender because there's no guarantee they're going to win work back. And from our own point of view, I mean, we like to we like to reward good performance. Uh, and there's a certain level of continuity that we want to see with, with contracts continuing. Um, but equally, we needed to test the market. So 52 um, uh, contracts went out to the tendered market. Um, there was a risk to that. We had no idea what we were going to get back in terms of contracts. Um, inevitably, a part of those 36 local contracts that were extended, prices went up. So we gritted our teeth a little bit when we went out to the market and we thought, crikey, what sort of prices are we going to get back? Um, this was key and this was quite a brave decision that we made and um, I think we all agree and I think this was important that it, as part of recovery coming from April or whenever it will be, bus is going to be key to, to, to aiding that recovery and, and I hope we're all agreement in that statement um, and we need to have a stable network to aid that recovery. So we decided to go out with a stable network to what it looks like um, as it is at the moment. It would have been easier for us to fear the financial ramifications of what that could cost us and to cut. I mean, so much as, as members will know when we come to these committees and the budget presses we've been in in the past have been about cutting networks, making efficiencies. And, and, and we felt, look, let's be brave. Let's try and go out and try and make a stable network. That doesn't mean to say we haven't made efficiencies. And that is very much reflected in the work that we brought to Annex C. So we tried to still make those efficiencies. So um, 11 services haven't remained the same. And Annex C has reflected that. So we've still made some simplifications. We've still some, made some efficiencies and that's reflected in Annex C. So the 151, the 397, we've done some work in Oldham. That was actually some feedback from Councillor Fielding where we tried to make some efficiencies there. Improvements to the 41 in the evening, that's in the report as well. We made some improvements to the Logistics North. Uh, so Annex C has still showed that we have some made some improvements there, but in the vast majority, the network has stayed the same. And that was kind of my point to, to Councillor Bray and Councillor Jones, that the, the report doesn't really illustrate the amount of work that we actually have done. We have tinkered with some, some stuff and we will still make some efficiencies, but we still wanted to main, maintain a stable network because it was important to do, we felt, in the current climate. Um, what we have done is just awarded these contracts for one year. Again, important because we are in unprecedented times and we wanted to see what recovery was like. We felt that was important as well for operators because they don't want to commit for too far in advance either until things begin to settle down. And we've also got clean air on the horizon in terms of April 2022. So we needed to take that complexity out of the equation as well. Um, I don't really want to go into the, the detail of the financial outcome in this section, Councillor Jones, if I may, if that's OK with you. So we can pick that up in part B. But I think it's important probably to say at this particular uh, junction is that the outcome of the tender round was that we had a particularly competitive market across all the tenders. I'll leave it for there for this particular a point in terms of the detail, but happy to pick that up with members in part B for a bit more detail. So um, I hope when you look at section of, of the report that you don't think it's been a quiet time for, for officers and operators. It's been particularly busy and that's really what I wanted to reflect in this particular part of, 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 of the section of the, of the presentation. Um, but I'm sure you never thought that anyway. Uh, let's move on then very quickly to school services from January 2021 because we came back after school as everyone will be aware to lockdown three. Um, schools have remained open but only remained open to key workers and, and vulnerable students. Um, but we were very keen to react quickly um, try to use the intelligence that we had from last summer when the schools were, were shut and we didn't want to run lots of empty school buses. We first 
wanted to remove the duplicate services. So these were all the services that were provided from funding from the DV um, that we had up till half term. Um, and so as soon as we knew that the, 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 the schools weren't going back, we immediately uh, cancelled those dupe services, knowing that we felt that the commercial services would um, would be sufficient to meet that demand. We are monitoring that closely. So they have been uh, cancelled. We have had a call with the DFE last week and they said to us they were really impressed with how uh, Greater Manchester reacted so quickly. Apparently no other authority has, has been so quick. Um, it's important we save public money. We didn't want those services running uh, uh, empty uh, and so we've cancelled those down up until half term. So good feedback from DFE that we acted so quickly. Um, the next thing that we looked at was the rest of the, the school network because we have a, we have over 600 contracts and we wanted to react quickly to those because um, again we didn't want to see empty buses running around. So we spoke to all the schools on that first week back um, again working a little bit on the intelligence we had from last summer. Um, it was important that we we didn't want to do anything that would cause any distress to the schools but it was clear that, that we could soon make efficiencies, engage closely with the districts as well. Um, and with effect from this last Monday, we were able to pull around about 30% of our school vehicles out of the network. And that was good because we believed it helped the operators as well with some of their resources, particularly with some of their drivers. And so we st stood down in the regions of just over 200 trips. And again, that is something that we will continue to monitor closely uh, within these next few weeks. So if you can pull more resource out, we don't really want to see empty school buses running around. And certainly where we think we've got ones and two kids running around on big buses, we'll probably work with districts as well where, you, where we can use taxis uh, more efficiently as well. I think the one thing we were slightly concerned a bit, and I think maybe members have picked up on this as well, where maybe some key workers are sending more kids into schools this this term than previously. So we were a little bit conscious around that. But by and large, we are pleased that we've been able to take some resource out of the schools uh, so quickly into this January term. So generally positive with how we've moved that forward. So that's an update on the schools. Uh, and that's really just picking up on the bus service levels on, on the back of what of the updates from some of the uh, operators we've had. As they've mentioned, discussions ongoing with DFT um, since the, the, the national lockdown from the 4th of January. I think the feedback from DFT is letting us get on with it sensibly uh, uh, with, with, with our operators. Uh, and, and really have discussions and, and see what the, the local market's like, what the local uh, demand is like. Um, as has been discussed already, we're not aware that any changes are going to be made to CBSSG um, in terms of that 100% that, uh, that level, uh, but we have to be sensible. I think, I think DFT will be keeping an eye on us and we are reporting back um, uh, at certain stages. Um, as Matt has already mentioned, I think we've got to keep an eye on the social distancing levels. There's no initial thoughts from DFT that they will change that. If they do, that will have an impact and will suggest that we will have to maintain resource levels because obviously that will squeeze capacity. So something to keep an eye on. Um, these are sort of the principles that we've kind of put in place that we've fed back to our operators and they are supporting. So we want the first and last trips to remain in place. I think that's important to, for key workers. No significant network timetable to, to change, nothing radical. And again, nothing less than 30 minutes so we can support that. And this is important as well. And I know this has been raised uh, by one or two members. We're aware of the work that's going on with the, the vaccination centres that that are cropping up. We know that's key and very important uh, for all of us at the moment to encourage that usage. So let's maintain services around those locations and including the Etihad, which is of course our, our key centre in the northwest. So we're keeping an eye on to make sure they're in place and we've done some work with Ring and Ride as well um, to, to, to enhance those, those uh, criteria levels. So all the operators have, have supported us in these. 
and and as we've mentioned on the call already looking to make some of those changes from the 30, 31st going forward which is in coordination with our change date um, at the end of the month and just to share some examples I spoke to Ben yesterday at Stagecoach she was happy that we shared this uh, and, and Adam has alluded to this with his update going forward so this is a sort of example that the, the, the operators have, 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 have shared with us. Uh, so Stagecoach, Monday to Friday daytimes, higher frequencies, services reduced in frequency to approximately two thirds of normal, but with nothing uh, 30 to 60 minute, 60 minute frequency services remaining. No changes to evening and early mornings, no changes to general network tendered services. That's gonna be across a case across all of our tendered services. And I think that's important because they, we know that they're for, for specialist areas and we want to, we want to make uh, key that, that that remains. No change to weekend services for stagecoats. Again, uh, important that there's duplicate services available in the event that we um, uh, highlight any loading issues. And I think this is important from, from Adam and, and, and his team, you know, that they'll look at, particular areas where we know there's high bus usage. So Middleton services would not change. So again, I think it's encouraging that operators will look at areas within GM where we know there's good, good bus usage and they're not going to change uh, uh, where we think there's pockets of high loadings in particular areas where there's key workers and they will do their analysis. And, and, th and that's good to see. So again, as we've heard on the call, all the other operators are supporting us, looking at reducing their levels. And generally, mileage across GM is expected to reduce as things stand at the moment to 80, 85 percent. But we'll look at that, we'll monitor it, and we will feed back accordingly to members. OK, um, it wasn't two hours, Councillor Jones. I hope it no, wasn't. It wasn't lacklustre. Have... It wasn't lacklustre, was it? You know, I talk a lot, Nick. No, that was <laughs> no, that was really good. I was uh, very impressed, and I, I think the purpose was just to demonstrate to members there's an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes, uh, and I think you've demonstrated that very clearly. Um, I mean, that presentation is just for noting for members, but if you've got any burning questions or comments, then speak up now. You're happy to note that report, and th yeah. thanks to yeah. Nick for that. Can, can we receive copies of that, those slides, please? Yes. Of course, no problem at all. Yeah, that, we'll do that. David? Yeah, th th thank you, Chair. It was only a quick comment. I just wanted to, to thank Nick, really, for, for being uh, responsive on the Etihad issue, because um, I've had a number of, of residents in my ward who have, have been allocated to the Etihad and, and were panicking because they were struggling to get there because they haven't got anyone to give them a lift there or, or any immediate friends and family. Um, so I'm really encouraged about uh, Ring and Ride being able to, to, to step in to, to, to help out there. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. OK, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Roy, I can I can't hear you, Roy. Unmute. I know it's perhaps not the place; it's the other subcommittee. But it's a quick question. Although we've got three vaccination centres in Bury, people are getting called to the Etihad. Some people, surprisingly, are not City fans and don't know where it is. But I've told them how they get there on the tram, and I think they go to the velodrome stop, don't they? Not the Etihad. Is that, does anybody know if that's right? Um, nope. Yes, that is right. Sorry, Catherine. Right. Thank you. And there is a, a travel advice page with all the information yeah. about how you can get there. These are people in their 80s and they're going on the tram from, you know, top side of Bury, bus into Bury, two trams. I don't want them getting off at uh, the Etihad stop and then trying to find their way down from that um, trench down there and up steps oh. and so on so no, it's uh, the velodrome thank you that's it well, city are not used to all those numbers of people turning <laughs> up at the stadium thanks <laughs> sorry i couldn't resist that meow okay. okay any other comments or questions all right thanks for that nick it was really good um item seven is changes to the bus network and review of subsidized bus services so nick and allison if you could just take us through uh, annex a to start with 
Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Councillor Jones, I covered most of the stuff in, sort of integrated it within that particular report. Um, Annex B, I just referred to the fact that the 36 and the 37 is that, that I think Matt will confirm is, is being withdrawn. Happy to take any questions. I think, um, Councillor Leach, I think you had a couple of questions in the chat around those services. John, are you around, John? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, well, first of all, can I just make a positive comment? Because I know I've consistently talked about lack of information about starting times and ending times. So uh, thank you to officers for starting including that information, which I think is very helpful um, in terms of uh, changes to the services. It, just on Annex A, just had a couple of very minor queries. Um, uh, in relation to the 300 service, um, why? Uh, what's the logic for having the bus services running 15 minutes later, the services running 15 minutes later than they have been? Um, and, uh, and in relation to the 635 service, um, the, uh, the, the services running every 20 minutes, is there any expectation that this will return to a 15 minute service when we get back to some level of normality? OK, Nick, Alison. I think that's one probably from Diamond because it's a commercial chain. So I don't know whether is Matt still on the call. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, so the 635 service, we're obviously monitoring passenger numbers. Um, the service was put out to an hourly service in the first lockdown. It's returned back to 20 minutes with with us monitoring passenger numbers weekly to see if the demand returns for, for a 15 minute frequency. There is a slight amend at the end of this month where the, the, there is some slack within the, the running time of the the operation. So we're extending that out to, to link in with, uh, with Wigan Hospital to to create an additional link that doesn't currently exist. Um, and uh, was there a question about the 300 service? Sorry. Yeah, that, yeah. That's also ours. So um, that's a Saturday only service, which um, was, with, was withdrawn in the first lockdown because there wasn't any demand to go to the Trafford Centre. Um, that continues to operate on Saturdays and there's been some some amends to it to, to get it to work in with services 20, 21 and 22 because they're all the services we operate that serve the Trafford Centre, so I presume it's it, it's about linking them together. OK, cheers. Thanks for that. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, Sean? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, to say thanks to the team for their engagement over the changes to the 151 service and incorporating the uh, connection from Failsworth to Ashton that was previously uh, axed. I'm really pleased that we've been able to find a, a long term solution to keep that connection between Failsworth and Ashton. Uh, when you let the contract for the temporary bus service that you put in, and it, which is the, the 397, I was concerned that the end date of that was mid April uh, because potentially a bus service that we campaigned to save in Failsworth was going to be withdrawn uh, immediately before I was up for election, which would have been embarrassing. So I'm glad that the patronage has been such that we can justify sustaining that service. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, engagement that I've had with officers too around the proposed route and that change prior to it coming to this committee. And I know that I've fed in some views around the route internally in Failsworth. Yeah, I do have, um, if it's not too late to change it, I, I am going to send in a suggestion uh, offline because I still do have a, a concern about um, stops being used in both directions and also I acknowledge the feedback that was given around a route that I suggested not necessarily being suitable for buses uh, but I will feed that in offline and, and okay. you can consider it but okay. yeah thanks uh, separately on the 184 service uh, I note in the paper that it says something around cost per passenger being higher than we would usually accept it does refer to a separate report which I don't seem to be able to find but just in relation to that particular service, it is something that I think that the operator and us should be looking to grow afterwards because it is it, it, it's a nice ride and it's something that people could be using for leisure when again we're able to freely use public transport in the way that we were not so long ago. Um, you know, I have people that travel from Oldham over to Huddersfield or did purely for the the scenery and things and to get off in the Yorkshire villages and go for a drink and I think that that is something that we don't necessarily 
um, promote in terms of bus travel. People use trains to get to destinations and, and go for leisure purposes, but they don't necessarily think of using the bus for the same thing. And I think that that is an example of a route that could be used and, and you could grow commercially uh, fair paying passengers on that. And I think it's probably more for, for first to consider than for us. Um, so one day, hopefully we'll be able to withdraw the subsidy because it will become a, a commercially viable service. But that's okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, I know John Leach has just put in the chat that he wants to comment on Annex B and C. So let's deal with Annex A first. Uh, what we're asking the committee to agree is that uh, no further action is taken in respect of the changes or the deregistered commercial services which are set out in Annex A. Are members happy to agree with that? OK, OK, let's move on to Annex B. John. Uh. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, the, my, my comment in relation to Annex B was, was really more a general point about um, the, the potential dangers going forward in relation to um, new developments that may or may not happen as a result of GMSF. Um, because clearly this, this, this service here was subsidised by the developer of this uh, housing estate going forward with lots of new housing developments expected in in future years i imagine there's the there's a distinct possibility of a lot of um a, a lot of conditions attached to planning consents uh, where developers are expected to support um, local bus services to new new estates are there any concerns by officers that we might left we might be left in with sort of similar situation here where after a certain time um, we're going to be expected to subsidize bus services uh, to brand new housing estates and given the given the scale of the expected developments that are to happen around greater manchester um, could this leave us with an enormous bill that we can't afford to um, to to continue to subsidize nick um I think that is always a concern. Um, I think the key to this is making sure um, we work early um, with developers and with colleagues in strategy just to make sure that um, uh, the expectation when putting on bus services um, can be realised. And certainly the, the key thing is, is that is that the work with operators as well, that the feasibility is that we can turn it into something that is uh, the long term expectation is it can be turned into something that's commercial. Um, I think in this particular instance, it was quite frustrating. Councillor Jones will be aware of this, that it was quite hard to influence the, the, the we were never able to influence the spending around this particular service. Don't know quite quite why that happened, but um, uh, uh, and, and it was able to run for a long period of time without TFGM being able to influence because it was something that had we been able to influence it early, I think we would have done something different with the funding. Uh, uh, and, and that's something that, that is important, that's something that runs for a while uh, that we believe can be changed and, and, and manipulated and done something differently. We should be allowed to have those influences. Yeah. Um, that's really important. Yeah, it's an important point, I agree. Anyone else on Annex B? Uh, Chair, can I just come back on that? Go on, John. Yeah, I, uh, I thank, thanks for the response to that. Would it be useful then to have um, some conversations with planning departments within the 10 local authorities about how they shape the, um, the conditions that are attached to planning, planning consents to ensure that uh, TFGM is actually involved in the process fully? Going yeah. Forward. Any any help like that would be supportive. I think we we've every right to, to to just remind local authorities when they're considering any kind of applications like that that they've got to take account of transport. Now, to be fair, I think most local authorities are a lot better at doing that now than they used to be a few years ago. But but you're right. I think we ought to remind them of that. Uh, did anybody else indicate on Annex B? If not, can we ask for your approval to Annex B? Is that agreed? Uh, on Annex C, 
Uh, John, did you have a separate comment on Alex C? Uh, yes, please. Um, it, it was a it, it was a specific question regarding the um, 41 service. Um, I just wanted to uh, check to see whether there are any concerns about the potential for re reliability issues with these changes um, because it is a very long service and uh, wh whether or not these changes might actually uh, affect the reliability. It's not I have to say, in my experience, it's not the most reliable of services already. And is there any concern that this might actually make it even worse? Um, I mean, I would hope that we haven't put out a tender where we've got concerns about reliability, because that's obviously something that we would take into consideration when we award a tender. Um, James, I don't know, have you got any concerns on this? We've got James on the call. Or maybe yeah, thanks, you, Nick. Yeah, or good that. morning, Chair. Um, I, I would hope not. Um, these are evening journeys on the, on the 41. Um, and I think the important thing we've achieved with this um, is that we've taken away uh, quite a glaring inconsistency in the timetable, um, which is partly a legacy of um, the way the service has been in the past. Um, so the, the revised timetable would enable passengers to make the direct links from North South. Uh, North Manchester to South Manchester. Um, obviously, we entirely appreciate the point made about reliability, but given that these are evening journeys, we would hope um, that this wouldn't uh, present any difficulties. But obviously, we will um, continue to monitor that in conjunction with our colleagues and take any remedial action required. OK, thanks, James. John, are you happy with that? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Oh, OK. Um, I've not seen any other indication on Annex C, so can I ask members to approve Annex C? Is that agreed? OK, I think we're now on. Well, I should know I'm chairing the meeting, aren't I? But anyway, we're on item A, exclusion of the press and public. So if there's Maybe. members of the press or public present, thank you for your attendance. But we need to now go into private sessions so we can consider tenders and other such issues. OK, thanks, Nicola.